And so you guys, I'm sure, are well versed on um, what's happening with restoration initiatives locally with mine contamination and probably across Montana with forest restoration. But really, we are seeing an explosion of restoration across the globe. When I was in college, if someone had told me that there would be the scale of restoration initiatives that we have today, I, I honestly, I would not have been able to believe it. So just as an example, the United Nations, through their different conventions, okay, including the Convention on Biological Diversity, has in their strategic plan to restore 15% of degraded ecosystems by 2020. That means that all nations who have pledged under this UN convention are agreeing that they're going to attempt to restore 15% of their degraded lands. Uh, no, we are not. However, we have made a pledge under another initiative, which is called the Bond Challenge. All of this is all this jargon associated with global initiatives, and they're usually named for the places where they were signed. So the Bond Challenge was signed in Bonn, Germany, right? And this was initiated by IUCN, um, and I currently serve as the chair of IUCN's thematic group on ecosystem restoration. So this initiative is very close to my heart, where different entities, countries, and private companies have pledged to contribute to restoring 150 million hectares of forest land by 2020. And the US pledged 10%, 15 million hectares as part of that initiative. And you know, there's been all these kind of going on surrounding these initiatives, including a group meeting in New York, the New York Declaration, where they created the 20 by 20 challenge, which was a challenge for Latin American countries to restore 20 million hectares by 2020. And the crazy thing is, these countries have pledging, have been pledging. I highlighted Chile because I'm, I'm now, um, I've transitioned in my work from mostly working in Montana and the Western US to now having a large program down in South America and particularly Chile. But you can see all these pledges and you know what? They have already achieved 30 million hectares of pledges of forest restoration. And so this, here's a picture from Kuwait. Uh, this is a story I love to share because in Kuwait, they pledged under the UNCBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, to restore 15% of degraded lands. And this is a seedling from the only remaining tree, native tree, individual native tree. Okay, you guys heard this right. There's one individual of the only native tree species that is left in all of Kuwait, it's in acacia. And these are babies from that tree, offsprings from the tree that are planted in a common garden. And so, you know, where we sit in terms of our restoration challenges and coming up with native plant materials for restoration is completely different than many countries across the world. Like here in Kuwait, where they don't even have populations to draw from to get these common gardens going, and yet they have pledged 15% and are in the process of achieving that goal. What's one of the major barriers to success, or maybe I'm saying that in kind of a negative, that one of the biggest challenges they're trying to overcome is developing native plant materials, our theme for today. Similarly, this is a chart from Chile, uh, or data related to Chile. It's in Spanish, but I think you can follow. You've got exotic species on the left. We've got native species on the right. This is data from one of my collaborators, a greenhouse study uh, that she did. She studied greenhouses and what they're producing. And what you can see is that 98% of what's being produced are these three exotic species, tree species, right? And you might recognize them, Pinus radiata, right? And then two eucalyptus, okay? Chile's temperate zone, just like here. And interestingly enough, one of their invasive species is lodgepole pine. 
It's a really bad invader down in Chile. But perhaps more importantly for restoration is the scale on the right. And you can see only something like 3% of all the plants in greenhouses are native species. And 60% are these three species which are not of conservation concern. The green dots indicate species that are of conservation concern and they have 33 tree species that are in that status. So in terms of a restoration agenda, I showed you Chile pledged, right? They pledged 0.5 million hectares to restore in a very short period of time, but the greenhouses currently don't have, even for tree species, uh, materials. So those are huge barriers to overcome. And Chile and many other countries are in the process of trying to get plant materials. And so, of course, the plant materials you choose, there's an economic cost associated with collecting seed, growing seed out, etc. By the time you have a seed or a plant to put in the ground, a bunch of money has been spent. And so, these native plant choices that we're making, if we're making good choices 100 years from now, we'll, we'll be happy that we invested our $50, right? However, if we're making bad choices about plant materials that go in the ground, we will have lost our opportunity. And in some cases, we may actually be creating messes that could potentially be costly to clean up. And so what I thought I would share with you today are three things. First, what are local, local ecotypes and why should we be considering them for restoration and revegetation pro, uh, projects? So I'll explain what those are. Secondly, when we say local, if we want to use locally adapted genetic material, local ecotypes, how local is local? How can we figure that out? And then third, are there other factors that we really need to be considering? Are we gonna wish 100 years from now that we hadn't had a focus on local ecotypes maybe? Or maybe it's local combined with some other factors? So what are those factors? And today I'm gonna to talk about other contemporary selective pressures, selection as in natural selection that, and adaptation, cytotypic variation, which is ploidy, chromosomal replication, and then to what extent do we need to consider the actual treatments we're seeding into in terms of our choices. And I was completely remiss, just for lack of time, in not including a slide that listed all the people who were leads or collaborators on the work I'll be presenting, and they include Alexis Gibson, who was a PhD student in my lab and now is a research scientist at the university. University. Victoria Wagner, who's from Germany and came and did a postdoc with me. Christine McManaman, who did a master's with me. And um, sure, I'm forgetting people. I will mention them as we go along the way. Um, okay, great. So let's start with what are local ecotypes and why consider using them? Okay. So Ecologists have been interested in variation among populations for really long periods of time. And in fact, there's this famous study from the 1940s where um, Clausen and collaborators put in this giant transect and then they looked at plants in different geographic locations. Let's see if I have a pointer on here. It's the center. 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 Oh, look at that. Thank you. Okay. So these plants look different, right? but they're all the same species. You can see that some are super tall with big inflorescences. And look at this one at bighorn, teeny tiny, right? And what people have discovered is that there's something driving that, that variation. It's not just random. And so you can see differences in fitness among these populations and they vary by where they're planted. So what people have noticed, and this is just a conceptual diagram, is that if you had a high elevation site and a low elevation site, and then you planted your high elevation species, you might see high fitness at the 
high elevation site. And do you guys know what I mean by fitness? Meaning ability to reproduce or success in reproduction and passing on your genes, okay? Uh, but here, look at this low elevation site. You see extremely low fitness at the low elevation site. Okay, so you probably guess where I'm going, okay? Here we've got the low elevation population. And when you plant it at the low elevation site, it has high fitness. But here at the high elevation site, it has low fitness. And this is the definition of local adaptation. It's when a population is adapted to have high fitness at its home site, right, to those conditions. And because of that, it doesn't do so well in other sites. And so I've now added in here the geographic environment in which each of these populations, in which each of these populations is growing. And you actually see patterns and variation based on their, the site conditions. One thing you can notice here is it's not just straight geographic distance, right? It's not the distance among, there's not a linear relationship in say size and distance from a particular site. Instead, it's based on what you could say is ecological distance how different the soils and climate and other factors, biotic environment, among sites are. And so before I showed you a conceptual diagram of local adaptation, so now here's an example from data from non-serpentine and serpentine soils. So of course the type of soils plants are growing in exerts a very strong selective pressure and we know that. Serpentine soils are a great place to study selection and adaptation because they have high metals and everyone here who's familiar with contaminated sites and restoration know that of course metals create problems for plants unless you have specific adaptations to deal with them. Serpentine soils are not contaminated. These are naturally high metal soils. And so you see the same pattern. Here we've got percent plants producing fruit in non-serpentine and serpentine soils. And so you see the non-serpentine populations produce more fruit on the, on the non-serpentine soils than they do on the serpentine soils. And of course, the amount of fruit you produce would lead to more seeds, which would potentially lead to better establishment and higher fitness. Okay, so to close out that first part, the benefits of using locally adapted plants, local ecotypes, is just that. They are, lo they are adapted to the local growing conditions and potentially have higher fitness, higher survival, higher reproduction, higher growth in those local environments. We have known for tree species since the 1950s, commercial tree species, where you can move them, right? How far you can move them from collection sites and still get those benefits of local adaptation. How, what, because it's been commercially important, right? You don't want to get dug fur from the interior basin and plant it on the coast and it may not be adapted to particular insects and diseases there, right? So that's all been very well worked out in our country. However, in other countries like Chile, they do not know anything about the spatial scale of ecotypic variation. There's one tree species, the monkey puzzle tree, or acaria, that just had a study that was done, but they're at the very beginning of this. So we thankfully are much further along. However, we know very, very little about the spatial scale of ecotypic variation. I know that's very jargony. You could just say it as how local is local, right? For the other species, and what do we use for restoration typically? We're, we're going after grasses, forbs, we're trying to you know, include more shrubs, et cetera. And so I wanted to just kind of, um, what do you say, open the black box of um, how you figure out because it's actually not that hard to do if you have access to a greenhouse, which you guys do here in Butte.
and a common garden. And so first of all, there's two different broad approaches. The first I'll just touch on briefly is this idea that, okay, well, we'll make these provisional zones. We won't really study species, but we'll kind of figure out where climate and soils are similar and then we'll, we'll use those provisionally um, and, we, and see how they do for seed transfer. And so here you see a map that shows um, different environmental conditions for an area. And in fact, some people have proposed using the EPA's level three ecoregions, which you can see here. Um, so by Missoula, we've got ecoregion 15, 16, and 17 kind of coming together, and you guys are in 17. Um, maybe we can just, you know, use these. I don't have time to show you today, but in my lab, we did a study uh, comparing the provisional zones to seed transfer zones that are made specifically for a species. And what you find is that the provisional zones don't work particularly well. And that's a bummer, right? Because if they did work well, it would be fairly easy. Just collect seed from um, ecoregion 17 and keep it in ecoregion 17. But it, unfortunately, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And so current best practice is to, oh, whoopsie, I skipped is to create species-specific seed transfer zones. My lab is currently working on 13 of these species-specific zones for herbaceous plants, so graminoids and forbs, and shrubs for Region 1 of the Forest Service. And so their idea is once we deliver these seed transfer zones to them, they will know where to collect, and once they collect, where, to, where they can safely move that seed to. And so, Here's an example of a Finnish seed transfer zone for mountain brome. Here's Missoula, and here's all these national forests that we love. Um, and what this map is showing is three zones. And so in this blue zone, you could collect here, and you could safely plant over here, here, and here, but not here in the brown zone. So how do we make these maps? How do we measure the spatial scale of ecotypic variation? I love this kind of assessment because it involves genetics to landscapes, right? You're using landscape ecology in terms of understanding you know, how this maps out onto the landscape and you're looking at selection and adaptation. So just a plug for any of you who think this topic is kind of cool. There's a big need. There's a big need not just here, but all over the world right now. And fun projects to do. So what you do, whoops, going backwards. What you do, the first step is you need some seeds. And you need some seeds from across your region of interest. And so I'm going to show you how we made that map for Mountain Brome. So in our case, we had 64 populations, and they were pretty well distributed. Um, across our study region, and they were distributed by national forest. Okay, step number two. You plant your seeds in a common garden because University of Montana does not have excellent plant growth facilities. We work at the Coeur d'Alene Nursery, which is really convenient with the Forest Service. We have a nice partnership going with the Forest Service. So we grow out the seeds. Then we measure traits, and here, if anyone's paying attention, measure potentially adaptive traits. What I mean by that is that traits that are, uh, indicate fitness, right? I said potentially because we don't really know. To be more honest, we measure traits that are easy to measure and that we think might show variation among populations. This is a cool area for thinking about more. So things like germination, height, crown width, crown reach, survival, vigor, insect damage, disease, et cetera. In this particular project, we also measured carbon isotope discrimination to get at water use efficiency. Okay, then what we do is we use some fancy math to measure variation among populations based on all of those traits. And this math that we use is called multivariate ordination and it is the primary statistical methods for community ecology. So we determine how much variation there is in all the traits among all the populations, 
And then we identify the relationship between that variability and the environment. And once we know that relationship, oopsie, ah, then we can map it, right? Because we know the relationship, we map it, and then we can therefore know um, where these zones discriminate on the landscape based on the environment. Now, I've used the word environment, but what do we actually measure in these seed transfer zones? Typically, they are made only with climate. And I should say, when I say typically, this is an area where we're, we're gaining rapidly, but for um, understory plants, non-trees, really it's only been the last 10 years where we as a scientific community have been assessing this variation. And almost all the assessments have been done just with climate. So we right now have a paper that's in press and ecological applications showing the difference in the map between a climate only derived version and the much more complex version that includes soils. And for any of you who are soil buffs, you can see here, this is an area where we have andesols um, in our state. And so you would imagine some pretty strong selective pressure due to those soils. And you know, uh, in this region in particular, where you see a lot of variation by soils, you could potentially be running into fitness problems if you don't include a greater set of environmental factors in your map. Now, those of you who are paying attention might say, okay, well, now you got soils, but certainly there's a lot more selective pressures than just climate and soils, for sure. So what that really means, in terms of answering the question, how local is local, is that these maps are hypotheses about how local is local. And can anyone think of how you would actually test whether these hypotheses make sense? Is it worth it? You can do reciprocal transplant studies just like I showed you in like the very first set of slides and measure the hypothesis is that fitness for these blue populations is going to be higher if I plant them in a blue zone, right? And vice versa. So that can easily be measured. They're simple experiments to do because we are actually outplanting all of this plant material. And it is expensive to collect locally. So it would behoove us to try to figure it out. Of course, it's a rabbit hole because when you're talking about fitness, it's lifetime fitness, so you'd have to do long-term experiments, et cetera. But I think this is a really exciting kind of next step for managers to think about. If you're investing in it, you might as well monitor whether you're getting your money's worth and maybe you don't even see, you know, maybe it's some other area of selection. Okay, so I'm on to my third topic. Should local adaptation actually even be the default choice? Is that the most genetically appropriate plant material, especially in an era of rapid change? So this is a map, not of seed transfer zones. It is a map of zones, but not seed transfer zones. This is a map of hardiness zones. So this is the kind of map you would use if you were purchasing seed for your garden or for agriculture, right? But it actually isn't even a map of hardiness zones. It is a map of change in hardiness zone over a 15 year period. You guys with me? So this map shows areas in the US, or it shows by area in the US, how much change there has been in hardiness zones. And so here we've got red, means it's been a change of two zones. One zone, yellow is no change, and then these are negative. So similarly moving one or two zones away, right? And so you see mostly color, right? I mean, like about half the US looks like to me it's changed at least one hardiness zone. So that means if you are ordering seed from a seed catalog in about half the areas of the US over just a 15 year period, you would have to change the zone that you were ordering for. And this map was made so people could who grow seed could update their zones. Well, that's pretty intense, right? 
Because local adaptation occurs over long time periods. And it is selection really to past conditions. Does that make sense? Selection to past environment, past soils, um, past biotic environments, right? So if you have environmental conditions that are different today than they were in the past, right, then the ecotypes that are found in a site may actually not be the most resilient ecotypes anymore in an era of rapid change. And so people are starting to think about this now. There's no right answer. You know, maybe you, some people feel you go with local ecotypes because it, it could be adapted to something you're unaware of, like drought sequences or insects, you know, local to the environment. Other people are saying, no, we got to add in a lot of variability, right? Let's get from lots of different zones because we don't know the future is unpredictable. The future environment is unpredictable. So we want to just increase genetic, you know, diversity. And some people say, well, we know what's coming. We should go from one zone further south or up or, or whatever. So people are really trying to grapple with this now in terms of choices for native plant materials. Something you don't hear a lot about, which our lab has worked on, is, you know, sure, we talk about climate change, but that's not the only part, not the only factor in our era of rapid change, right? We also have amazing changes in the biotic environment. So where formerly plants were growing in areas that had a diverse mix of forbs and graminoids, now there's intense pressure in some areas from things like leafy spurge, knapweed, et cetera. So potentially, maybe instead of having local ecotypes, what we want are ecotypes that are gonna be more successful in tolerating growing with invaders or hey maybe even suppressing the invader right maybe that's more important than local in terms of fitness it could be so we did an experiment i'm going to show you we found plants that we called invader experienced this is not an actual picture of our site just to give you an idea but imagine some gra grasses growing in this field and this is going to be my icon my symbol for this, this grass. Growing with, this is my symbol for knapweed, okay, for my invader experience. Uh-oh. Okay, other populations, look at this. No invader, right? And so here in my symbol, you see them without uh, my icon for my knapweed. And our question was, is there phenotypic variation between the populations that have been growing with the invaders and the ones that have no experience. So our invader experience versus our invader naive. And so we designed an experiment, an experiment where we had 14 wild populations that we collected. Six had, had, were that condition where there was no knapweed around. Eight had a history of growing with knapweed and I, I don't actually recall the details, but we had some criteria surrounding how long the knapweed had to be present, et cetera. And then here's the design of our experiment. It was a fully factorial design where we had our seed from our invasive, naive moms, okay? And we grew them as a control without the invader, and we grew them with the invader. That was our treatment, our competition treatment. And then we also had these seeds from moms that were growing with knapweed, and we grew them alone, and we were working with Blue Bunch, I don't think I said that, Blue Bunch Wheatcrust. Okay, so we grew them alone and we also grew them in competition. And in the graphs I'm gonna show you, these guys have the shaded, black shaded, and these will be the open bubbles. Okay, so I'm gonna show you what we found, which I think is really cool. So we've got biomass here, which is one of those potentially adaptive traits, okay, a measure of fitness. It's hard to measure lifetime fitness, lambda, Maybe you guys have studied how you do that, population viability. You need to know all the different life history transitions. So usually what you see is some measure of fitness like biomass or, or germination, seed set. And here we've got control and invaded. Okay, and so we're gonna show you for invasive experienced and invasive naive populations. 
And so in our control, when we just grew the blue bunch by itself, the populations that were from the areas that hadn't been invaded and the areas that had been invaded had similar biomass. Okay? However, when we grew them in competition with our knapweed, you see that these experienced populations maintain their biomass, whereas the invasive naive, the ones that hadn't experienced growing with, with uh, knapweed, had a reduction, pretty substantial reduction in biomass. And we saw this also for a variety of factors. Here we've got the longest leaf where you see a cross, but with more variation. So I think these are really interesting results. We as a scientific community don't have a lot of information about the extent to which populations can or have adapted to growing with invaders. But certainly, there's potential to think about suppression and tolerance. Again, suppression, tolerance, how you grow with an invader, suppression, whether you can, when you're there, the invader does less well. And one thing I did want to show you is this is a cultivar. Often we use cultivars, those are agriculturally grown out for large production of a native species. And the cultivar was the worst in being able to both tolerate and suppress. And so it kind of gives you pause in terms of what we're setting out there on the landscape. Okay. There's something else that really needs to be considered besides local adaptation, and that's cytotypic variation. And I like to talk about this topic because I think sometimes, at least at UM, students think, ah, oh, I gotta take cell and molec, and I gotta take genetics, and why do I have to take all this stuff? Well, there's actually some pretty good reasons why we need to understand cells to genes to landscapes, and here's an example of one of them. So I didn't explain why I have this icon, but this is just showing that on the outside, you know, if you don't look carefully, they could look the same. But then when you take a deeper look, you see differences. And so in this case, this deeper look is uh, the ploidy level of the population. And so if you remember your genetics, we see you know, chromosome pairs, different numbers of replicates of chromosomes, right? And when species are able to have different levels, they're called polyploids. And so here we've got diploid, triploid, and tetraploid, right? And so you can have examples of individuals within the same species where one individual can be diploid and one can be tet tetraploid. Okay, the problem is when you mix those ploidy levels. So roughly 13% of species have multiple cytotypes or exhibit polyploidy. And it's kind of well known that crosses between cytotypes can reduce population fitness. So when you go from diploid to tetraploid, when those cross, you get diploid. So here's just a few quick examples. Triploid um, individuals often have aborted seeds. And so here's germination percentage and look at the triploids, right? A real reduction in germination. Here's again, relative fitness and you see a real reduction, okay? So here's the crazy thing, right? Hopefully this is gonna kinda be like a wake up minute in my talk, right? So for blue bunch, our study species that I just talked about in terms of its potential ability to adapt to growing with invaders, most populations are diploid. However, there was some stuff in the literature about ploidy levels, especially in the northern part of the range. It's really commonly used in restoration. It's like dumped from airplanes all over the place. We really, for many species, don't investigate the ploidy levels. We just assume it's not an issue, right? Well, here's what we found in our region. We, these are all the, some of the sites that we used for that, um, the study I just showed you. And what I'm gonna show you now is the frequency of 2X, 4X, and mixed populations. And what you see here is that within, these are the level three ecoregions, which I showed you in the very first part of the talk, remember, in the map of the US. And so 
15, 16, and 17, you can see that there's different patterns of polyploidy across the region, right? And so what that means is that if we're moving seed around, and if you want to preserve your population viability, meaning the ability to not have to keep dumping seed there, right? If you want plants to produce seed that are viable, you need to worry about not mixing ploidy levels. And that's probably something that's not happening when we're letting seed go from airplanes. Okay, rolling in on the last bit of my talk here. Um, another thing you really need to consider is where you're putting these seeds out, right? So your restoration treatment site is a site that's been degraded and that's also having treatment activities you know, versus a natural site. And so maybe you have different considerations for seed that you're using. And so I wanted to give an example from herbicide treatments. So we use a lot of herbicides to control invasive plants. These are the top five used herbicides in terms of area treated based on a review I did with Victoria Wagner, She's, uh, Victoria was the lead um, for North America. And this is the frequency in terms of number of all the articles that we could find on effects of herbicides on native plants. And so you can see for some of these really frequently used herbicides, we have very little information on how they affect native plants. So we designed a study, it was a greenhouse study, where we tested two herbicides, pycloram and aminopyrrolid. We used full strength, that's 1x, and we also used 0.01 strength. And we used this to replicate drift, like what areas adjacent to a sprayed area might feel. Is it accurate for drift? I actually have no idea, but we were just curious if you used a tiny bit, you know, what you would see. Okay, and we tested a bunch of grasses and native forbs. And here's what our experiment looked like in our greenhouse, uh, it was all random. And what we found was that both the herbicide types, we tested those two herbicides, at both rates really reduce germination and biomass. Okay, so here we've got a native aster. This is number of emerged seedlings per pot. Here's our control, which just got water. We've got 10 seeds per pot. Here's everything else. Both of our herbicides, both treatments. We got no germination, right? The crazy thing is that these were broadleaf um, targeting herbicides, but check this out. Monocots and dicots were equally affected by pleuromid pychlorum at both rates and aminopyrrolid um, at the full strength. So here's the Elmus, and you see essentially the same pattern except for aminopyrrolid at that drift strength, right? So, okay, so if we're planting into herbicide sprayed soils, then maybe we have to think about putting seed in that's gonna be effective at growing in herbicide soils. And I had a grad student, Christine McManaman, who has a paper in restoration ecology where she tested the decay rate. Like if you wait a year, what do you see? And for some species, even after one year, you still saw, we still saw substantially reduced germination and shoot biomass. However, the cool thing was for other species, right? Um, we saw variation, rebounding quicker. And so here's my last data slide. Do the effects of herbicides on germination vary by species? Here's my two um, herbicides, right? And this is reduction in germination, so percent. So this 100% means 100% reduction in germination. And this is time since spraying. This graph is just from 50 days, but she has another published study that goes out a full year, 11 months. And so, Okay, here's another native aster, and we see, look at this, no variation, 100% reduction after 50 days, and we saw species that over the 11 months, 100% reduction. However, even just in that 50-day period, we've got our Festuca idahoensis, right, which is kind of rebounding. So in aminopyrrolid sprayed areas, we, we see a decrease in the loss of germination, so better germination, right? So this is potentially really important. Now I'm not talking about ecotypic variation, but just species, what species we wanna pick. Maybe in herbicide-treated sites where we feel we have to use herbicides, we need to think about species 
native plant materials that are going to be resilient to growing in herbicide conditions. And I think you could think about that in a broad context of the different kinds of sites we work in for restoration. And also not just in terms of species, but in terms of ecotypes that might do better in degraded areas. So significance, just wrapping back to the start of my talk, we have this crazy intense challenge for restoration right now, right? If we fail at restoration, governments, the UN, people aren't going to want to invest in it, right? If we have success, we likely may have like the century, the restoration century, you know, maybe people reading textbooks 300 years from now will say, yeah, the 2000s were the century of restoration, right? And I think the difference is how smart we go about it. And how smart we can go about it really depends on, in my view, how much ecology um, and how much thinking we put into it and how much monitoring we do to ensure that what we're doing is effective. And so for native plant materials where we have this huge need to get stuff in the ground, uh, I think a lot of people are like, yeah, let's just get that Let's just get that tree in the ground. And I, I wish I had thought to put in an end slide from Chile of a restoration project where you see every single tree dead of Langa because it happens not just in Chile, I don't mean to pick in on Chile, but all over the place, you know, where we're putting out plant material and it's not effective. And so I, I really think it behooves us to, um, to be careful with our choices and to think through from genes to landscapes. So that's it, thanks. Thank <laughs> you.